Okay. And we're recording. So good morning, everyone. And uh, it's good to see that we have um, students and alumni and friends joining us uh, from Lebanon. Welcome to this uh, session of Alumni Talks, which is an initiative of the Office of Development and Alumni Affairs at Notre Dame University, Louise. Uh, my name is Nisreen Sfer. I am the director of the Office of Development and Alumni Affairs, and it's great to see everyone joining us uh, this morning. As you've noticed, um, your uh, microphones have been muted. And just in case, when you join, they're not muted. I kindly ask you to mute so we can uh, lose the echo and have a smooth... Um, uh, conversation and enjoy uh, this great talk about a very interesting topic. Cameras have been also uh, turned off. Now for the questions, we can um, uh, either tackle them as we move um, uh, forward with the uh, talk or leave them um, uh, at the end of the sections. I'll leave it to Karina to just um, uh, Pop the question and say, guys, if you have any question. The for those who are not very familiar with Teams, just like Zoom and any other um, uh, platform that uh, we're using for those calls, you can simply raise your hand. I just just did. It's on the very thin rectangle that you have on your screen, and you can simply type your question on the uh, chat. Just and I'll of course. Uh, support and help Karina so she can take uh, the time and uh, really answer those questions. Um, so um, with no further ado, I just want to um, again welcome everyone and welcome especially our special guest and uh, alumna expert for today, Karina Khurikhsoub, who is graduate of 2013. Uh, as I mentioned before, she is joining us from Dubai, where she is currently working as a clinical dietitian and an eating disorder practitioner at the American Center for Psychiatry and uh, Neurology, which is a CBTE accredited specialized multidisciplinary outpatient eating disorders and obesity program. She is also a member of MIDA, the Middle East Eating Disorder Association, um, uh, and um, that I Thank you for uh, really talking about um, a very interesting topic for professionals, but also for everyone. Um, Karina also has taken on uh, dietary habit advocacy and awareness as an active part of her role by giving talks and presentations just like this one um, that we're having this morning. On that note, I want to say that this morning's talk is a special one. It is addressed to health practitioners and professionals like dietitian and uh, psychologists. Um, and it is also a responsibility that I believe the university has towards um, alumni, but also the community in general to raising awareness about how we need to deal sometimes with um, certain um, uh, eating disorders and, and how we have to be responsible towards um, uh, patients in really, um, 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 how do you say it, um, um, analyzing the case of uh, the patient and trying to help him or her uh, properly. Most of us, specifically when we are in times of stress, a kind of um, go into crashing diets and um, uh, what's a trend. Like uh, today we're talking keto, we're talking detox, we're talking all of that. And all of this could be very helpful. But beneath um, uh, some of those um, eating disorders um, problems lies another dormant health issue, which is not always um, the health of the body, but the health of the mind. And this is where it is very, very important that um, you as health professionals uh, um, diagnose properly that and try to help your patients in the best way. And for even the patient, it is also important to understand that no eating disorder is um, a problem, just like having a toothache, and it has to be addressed 
the best way for, um, well, to see results, one, but also to tackle the root cause of things. And I hope this is a nice intro. Uh, but, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just really wanted to put things into its perspective. It is not a business talk today, but it is also a topic that is uh, quite relevant in, in these times of uh, COVID-19. And it is um, everyone's responsibility. All of us need really to put some uh, part of um, uh, things at front to talk, um, uh, uh, to raise awareness and to maybe say and, and t uh, tell each other, you know what, you've been struggling with your weight. Why don't you see if you're actually having an eating disorder? And maybe many of those who are joining us uh, today would uh, think of a friend or of a family member that they've seen binge eating um, or, or they feel uh, the person is not dealing with a stressful moment of his or her life and could say, you know what, um, go see a specialist. We've seen something and let's really take this as, as um, um, a responsibility for professionals, but also for individuals. Yes, exactly. So with really no more talking from my end, I uh, leave this uh, e floor to you, Karina. Thank you so much for being us again with us uh, this morning on a Saturday. And uh, the e floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be part of this alumni talk and to be able to share my passion for eating disorders. Uh, like you said, the introduction was on point. Uh, it is addressed to healthcare professionals, dietitians, psychologists, but as well as uh, for the community. And uh, one of uh, the main uh, role and um, goal of this uh, presentation is really also to just raise awareness about eating disorders for the community and to know at least some action point that we can do to prevent this, uh, this mental health illness uh, to spread and to affect us or our loved ones or our siblings. Um, and I'm really happy that we're doing it in June 6 because actually the Eating Disorders Awareness Day, Action Day, happened in June 2nd. It's every June 2nd yes. each year. So um, mm -hmm. for me, I'm basically uh, concluding a full week of awareness that the Middle East Eating Disorder has, Association has been doing. Um, so for those who want... Nice. For more, um, the, they can just uh, uh, follow Mida on the social media platforms and they can look again at all the awareness talks and Q&As that happened and I'll be concluding it with my presentation today. Nice. So uh, um, I will first share my presentation with you guys. Let me know if you can see it properly. So, um, I yes seeing it but i will put it on exactly just put it on presentation mode yeah right okay and i think um uh, um we have more guests uh, and participants joining so good morning to everyone you're like we just starting uh karina please okay so uh, all the content of my presentation is based on uh, uh, the MIDA, so Middle East Eating Disorder Association content, but as well the Academy for Eating Disorders, and this is evidence-based, okay? So uh, let's move. Eating disorders are quite prevalent worldwide. Um, you know, based on multiple studies, one in five people suffer from any kind of disordered eating, 70 million people worldwide suffer from an eating disorder and unfortunately 95% of the sufferers are actually teenagers. Uh, so eating disorders start at a very young age, it starts in the teenagers years and it affects mainly uh, girls. Uh, eating disorders are on the rise every year and it, the prevalence increased uh, from 3.5% in the years 2000-2006 to 7.8% from the years 2013-2018. And uh, these numbers honestly are underestimated. 
still. Um, wow. Yeah. So in our region, now, unfortunately, we lack data like in any other field. Uh, one reason is that in the Middle East, there's a huge stigma around all mental health disorders uh, in general, and especially when it comes to food issues, uh, we, we, we have the tendency to like take it a la légère, like you can say. So it's, mm. e it's either, sorry for that, but and you will lose weight or it will sure. more like Yalla, hali ku aktar. so again the data are underestimated but in Lebanon there are two studies that were published and I'm happy to share them with you so the first study uh, it is based on an adult sample they took 811 people adults they were uh, an, on average 28 years old and it has been shown that 48.3% of them uh, um, had restrained eating. What we mean by restrained eating, it means they limit the amount of the food they eat on purpose as a means to control their weight. So we can see that it is a number that is quite high and That's really huge. normal eating. Another study, well, it was a review study and it showed based on multiple studies, it's estimated that eating disorders are prevalent in our population, in the Lebanese population, in a way that bulimia nervosa accounts to 46% of eating disorders, anorexia nervosa accounts for 40% of eating disorders, and binge eating uh, accounts for 14%. So I would like to share with you some facts that I'm sure uh, they will stuck in your mind so you can know the basic facts about eating disorder. Um, the first fact, uh, eating disorders are deadly. They can kill. Every day, 23 people die worldwide from the medical complications of either anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. And uh, eating disorder is a mental illness. It is not a lifestyle choice. No one decides to have an eating disorder. And in fact, it is the deadliest among all mental disorders that you might think. Uh, five to 20% of uh, anorexic sufferers die from it, either due to the medical complications that we mentioned in the first fact, or due to suicide, because it is linked with depression. It is linked with suicidal thoughts. Uh, the third fact is that it can affect anyone. We are all at risk of getting an eating disorder from all genders, from all ages, from all races, ethnicities, body shape, weight, sex orientation, as well as socioeconomic statuses. So really, everyone can get it. Uh, the fourth fact is that um, someone who is suffering from an eating disorder might look healthy but yet may be extremely ill. So we cannot judge from the appearance of someone and say, oh, he or she has an eating disorder. No, really, weight has nothing to do with whether someone is suffering from an eating disorder or not. Unfortunately, only one out of 10 sufferers get into treatment. And this is really unfortunate because a full recovery is possible. But for that, we need an early detection and intervention. They are crucial. And that's why raising awareness will actually open the eyes for an early detection. And my last fact is that all eating disorders start with a diet. And I will move on with the presentation and you will understand the correlation between both of them. So I would like first to give you a definition about eating disorders. How can we say that someone has an eating disorder? Well, it's when someone has a problematic and obsessional relationship with the food. When basically uh, this person is completely obsessed, consumed by their weight, their shape, what they are eating, their food, to an extent that it is impairing their life their everyday life. It is impa impairing and impacting their life uh, in terms of their families, uh, relationships, uh, studying, social life, uh, work life. So literally all other areas because they are so consumed by their weight, shape, eating and food. 
a sufferer from an eating disorder will always use food to go further than satisfying their hunger. And there's two extremes. Either they will use the food as a mean to control their weight, so by restrictive eating to control their body weight and shape, or the other extreme, they will overeat, they will indulge in an excessive amount of food as a mean to cope for their emotions and feelings. So, like I said, like the sixth fact said, all eating disorders start with a diet. And when I mean by diet, I'm not talking about moderate weight loss diets that are balanced, that look for healthy eating behaviors. I'm really here talking about restrictive and severe dieting, when we restrict the quantity or the quality of the food. So, some facts about diets, and I'm sorry to say this, and I know that I have fellow dietitians and they might take it in the wrong way, but please, again, I'm talking about severe restrictive dieting. So it is known and it has been shown by so many studies that severe dieting is the number one risk factor for developing an eating disorder. Dieters are eight times more likely to suffer from an eating disorder than non-dieters. And 35% uh, of normal dieters will eventually evolve into developing an eating disorder. And diets are inefficient. And I'm sure, so first there's the studies that support that. So 90 to 95% of dieters end up regaining the weight after one to five years. So on a long term, again, severe and restrictive diets. And, um, you know, I'm sure that all of you, you might have experienced it yourself or you know someone or in your practice, you see people coming to you and telling you, I gained weight. Ask them if they did diets. Most of them will tell you at least they've, do, they've done four types of diets. Every time they lost some weight, but then regained either all the weight or even more. So that as a conclusion, it is harmful because the person will have a feeling of failure. It will be uh, associated with depression, uh, a lowered self-esteem eventually, and as a consequence also, it will impact their social life and it will lead to some social anxiety. So it can be harmful to fall into the chronic dieting cycle. So what usually happens after dieting as we can see, and as the research shows, it leads to weight gain. But how does it happen? So here is a very simplistic way of explaining it because it is an introductory uh, discussion, but I will do my best to give you the full knowledge so you can understand. So when someone is severely and restrictively dieting, the body will perceive it as famine, as starvation because we still have the same genetic pool as our ancestors, the cavemen. Our genes didn't evolve in that. Our genes are still uh, made in a way, designed to fight starvation, because till now, even if we're in 2020, there's still food scarcity around the world. So we will diet severely, restrictively. Of course, at the beginning, we will lose weight. And eventually, we will start to lose our muscle mass. But our genes is made to fight that starvation. So our body will adapt to this starvation by decreasing our metabolism. So we can literally be able to survive on that diet. So let's take, for example, someone who is following a 1000 calorie diet, the metabolism will drop and will maintain uh, on the 1,000 calorie diet. It will start to burn 1,000 calorie diet. But since it's a very restrictive and severe diet, obviously we cannot live all our life on that. So eventually we will go back to normal eating, let's say 1,500 calories. But our metabolism is still burning the 1,000 from the diet. So this extra 500 calories that we are eating will lead to weight gain. So basically every diet, severe diet, teaches the body to adapt better to the next self-imposed famine, starvation, by 
slowing down the metabolism, the body efficiently use, utilizes less calories and burns less. So yes, some people, chronic dieters, will develop an eating disorder. So what are the types of eating disorders? Uh, this is based on the standard classification for men of mental disorders by the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, the standard classification, we can find it in the DSM-5. So they classified eating disorders into four types for uh, the anorexia nervosa, the bulimia nervosa, the binge eating disorder, and the OSFED, which is other specified feeding or eating disorders. I'll go through them. So how can we characterize someone from having anorexia nervosa? So a first criteria, it's someone who is really obsessed by their weight, obsessed to lose weight to a point that they are restricting severely, severely sorry, their food intake, which will result in a significantly low weight. Uh, they have an intense morbid fear of gaining the weight so they are as well obsessed with the number on the scale and it is associated with a disturbance in the way they see themselves so as much as they are losing weight they still perceive themselves as being overweight so they will keep continue per, to pursue weight loss even more bulimia nervosa is characterized by a cycle of binge eating and compensatory behaviors. So what is binge eating? Binge eating means when someone eats a large amount of food so, uh, that most individuals will perceive as very large amount of food in a very short term of time, a short period of time, less than two hours. And they, uh, they do say that they have a sense of lack of control over their eating during that episode. They completely lose control. They don't know how. They don't know how to stop. And then it is followed with the compensatory behaviors. Uh, they are very dangerous behaviors, very and ineffective methods. And the purpose for them is to get rid of the calories they have ingested. So what they might do is vomit, self vomiting, or use laxatives, or use diuretics, use uh, diet pills, uh, injections, or even extreme and severe uh, excessive exercises. And that cycle, binge eating compensatory behaviors, need to happen at least once a week for a period of three months. So we can say that someone is suffering from bulimia nervosa. And the last criteria that is really important is that these suffer, they, they over-evaluate their shape and weight to a point that their self-esteem and self-worth is entirely or mainly based on their shape and their weight. Binge eating disorder is characterized by binge eating episodes. However, there's the absence of compensatory behaviors. They just binge eat they lose control over their eating, but they don't use any method to get rid of the calories ingested. But as well, they are evaluating their self-esteem and self-worth based entirely on their body shape and weight. OSFED, it's an umbrella for other types of eating disorders that don't fit the criteria of anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating. We have the night eating syndrome, so anyone who is restrictively dieting during the day and then binge at night, and it is usually associated with sleep disorders. We have bigorexia, and we are seeing people suffering from bigorexia even more, especially males, uh, those who are uh, obsessed with gym. So uh, the point here is they are obsessed uh, with being bulky, with being muscular. And uh, how they perceive themselves is to be skinny or to be small. Uh, they don't see that they are muscular enough. They always pursue to be more muscular. And, um, and that is uh, how basically they are completely obsessed with their body. It's uh, uh, body dysmorphia type. Orthorexia, also we are seeing even more people suffering from orthorexia, and this is the obsession of eating only entirely pure and healthy foods. 
So um, people suffering from orthorexia are rigid and inflexible. They really focus on healthy and pure food. And uh, for them, it is. they say that it is a reason uh, to, to be healthier, but as a reality, it is also a mean to control their weight. And it is possible for someone suffering from orthorexia to binge on healthy food. And this is a typical quote that we might hear from someone suffering from orthorexia. I don't eat meat or any animal products because it's cruel to animals. Gluten makes me bloated. I'm intolerant to lactose. Sugar makes me tired. But I don't know why I'm losing weight. So we can see the rigidity in the eating uh, in that person. And eventually that would be a plate of someone suffering from orthorexia. It's basically uh, very rigid, very limited. And here I want to move with you uh, to explain to you uh, why do people, some people, eventually binge eat. So there are reasons for that. The first cause, it's a physiological deprivation. So like I told you, we still have the same genetic pool as our ancestors. So when we restrictively and severely diet, our body is designed to fight starvation. So there is going to have, uh, there's going to be a physiological change that will happen, a hormonal change in our cortisol levels, serotonin, and endorphins that will make us crave food, that will make us seek food, constantly think of the food. And uh, for that, to just give you an example, think of when you, for example, uh, for religious purposes, fast. What the first thing you might think when you're fasting for long hours or when you decide to cut down on a specific food, you will actually keep thinking or craving that food. And uh, the physiological response when it's a very a severely and uh, restrictive diet, it will make you seek food for just the survival purposes. And that's why eventually it is inevitable that you will give in. And that's not because you lost control or you don't have enough control yourself. It's really due to the physiological deprivation. And here comes the psychological deprivation. So the diet mentality. Um, anyone who wants to go uh, and start a diet, a restrictive diet, they will tell you, tomorrow I will start my diet. So tonight... I'm going to eat everything as much as I want because tomorrow or on Monday, I will start my diet. So I might as well now enjoy it. So this is the last supper mentality. And everything that is forbidden is being craved. eventually. So when we go into these restrictive and severe diets, not only our body physiologically will pressure us to overthink and to crave these food, but as well the psychological deprivation, which is if I just given once, I ruined my diet, I shouldn't have had this. This is also one reason why we are at risk of binge eating. And the third cause is emotional reasons. So not everybody know how to cope with their emotions and feelings. Some people lack the internal self-regulatory machine. So they always need something external to be able to self-regulate uh, and to fill this emotional void, which is loneliness, boredom, uh, stress. And what they will use only, their only and sole coping mechanism or their main mechanism is food. All of us, sometimes we eat because we are bored, we are happy, we are stressed, but we have other coping mechanisms. But some people don't have other coping mechanisms. Their main coping mechanism is food. And this is when uh, it is a problem and it leads to binge eating. So these sufferers will eventually fall into patterns, into cycles. Uh, there's two types of cycles. So when they will break their diet 
their severe diet or when they will give in to the food, uh, that will make them feel guilty, ashamed, depressed, and it will activate the what the heck response. I blew it. I might I might as eat as much as I want right now. Tomorrow I will start again my diet. So this will lead to a complete vicious cycle, a never ending vicious cycle of restriction leading to binging due to the physiological and the psychological pressure. In some people, they will feel so bad, so ashamed. They are so worried to gain weight due to the binge eating that they will go into compensatory behaviors to get rid of the calories they have ingested. And they will start again their severe and restrictive diet. And this will lead them again to binge eating and it continues. And it's a never ending cycle, which also they will lead them to fall into another dangerous and addictive cycle, which is I'm using compensatory behaviors. I'm using dangerous and ineffective methods to lose weight. But I feel so ashamed, so deprived, so guilty that due to my negative emotion and I don't know how to cope with my emotions and feelings, I will blow it. I will overeat to seek comfort. But then I will feel so guilty and so ashamed and so depressed that I will use again, the compensatory behaviors. And really, once they fall into these cycles, they don't know how to get out of it. And it is really out of their hands. So what are the clinical presentation for binge eating disorder? Um, it mainly affects women, but one third of them are males. Uh, it affects a broad age range. Usually we see binge eating disorders in adulthood, not in teenagers. Uh, generally, uh, people who binge eat, they overeat in general, but it is also followed with episodes of binge eating, the loss of control over their eating, and it coexists with obesity. But it doesn't mean that everyone who is suffering from obesity suffers from binge eating disorder. Actually, 35 to 50 percent of obesity uh, patients suffering from obesity have a binge eating disorder, but all sufferers from obesity have the emotional eating. So it's important when we see someone in our practice who is overweight, who is suffering from obesity, to before putting them on a diet, whatever the diet is, to check if they fall within the 35 to 50 percent uh, of the population to see if they are suffering from a binge eating disorder or not. So yes, some people will really do anything to get uh, to to avoid gaining weight, and they will use behaviors that are harmful, that are dangerous, that are excessive, such as excessive exercising, not normal exercising, exercising really to to as an obsession, as a mean to control their weight excessive uh, restriction of food. So again, not a moderate weight loss, but really restriction. And some of them, not all, will use uh, dangerous and ineffective methods. Like we said, uh, pills, uh, laxatives, diuretics, uh, vomiting. Uh, and these people who do use these ineffective methods are basically those who are suffering from bulimia nervosa. So the clinical presentation of bulimia nervosa, uh, bulimia nervosa mostly affects women, uh, typically seen in late adolescence, so when they are in their 20s. And uh, some of patients suffering from bulimia nervosa started as being uh, anorexic, anorexics because uh, it all starts with a the diet. They start with the restrictive dieting, severe dieting, but at some point they will not be able to control their restriction, their intake, their food intake, and they will give in, they will binge, but they won't accept the binge they, because of the intense fear of gaining weight, and this is when they will use the compensatory behaviors. So quarter of the cases would have met a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa. That's why we say that eating disorder, it's a transdiagnostic 
uh, we have a transdiagnostic approach because people might merge from anorexia nervosa to bulimia nervosa. And sufferers from bulimia nervosa usually are of a normal weight. Why? Because they are binging and because the compensatory behaviors they are using to get rid of the calories are actually inefficient. And uh, just to let you know, uh, a binge episode, uh, it has been shown by studies, on average is around 2,000 calories to 3,000 calories per binge. And using any sort of compensatory behaviors, at least the body will retain 1,200 calories of the binge. So they will not, uh, people will not be able to get rid of all the calories, even though they just vomited after their, their, their food, their episode, at least the body will retain 1,200 1, calories. So that's why they are not skinny, they are not underweight, they are more of a normal weight. But like we said, some people who started with restrictive and severe dieting who are suffering from anorexia nervosa will be able to continue with their food restriction. And uh, the issue here is that unfortunately, uh, the, the society, because we don't know really about eating disorders, when we see someone uh, very rigid and very uh, strict about their eating and seeing them, for example, completely avoiding sweets, desserts, or fast food, it is praised in the society. It is positively reinforced by our environment. So at the beginning, they will have a sense of achievement. They will have a sense of control, uh, of being special. Uh, they will go into a euphoric phase at the beginning. Uh, it's uh, very much similar to uh, a honeymoon phase. Everything is perfect at the beginning to a point that for a short period of time, it will improve their body image. They are losing weight. This is what they want. They are very uh, self-confident. It even improve their mood. Uh, but it's just the beginning. At, at the end, um, it will be disastrous for them. It will impair their life because even if they reach their first goal, it will never be enough for them. They will always seek further weight loss. Why? Because they are, they have a distorted body image. They always see themselves overweight, although they are underweight. And uh, as well, it is a mean for them to control uh, their life, to control, uh, it's a distraction from other problems that they might face in their life. It is also a coping mechanism. And when they are not able to control the, their surroundings or the events that's happening in their life, but they are able to control their food and their weight, uh, they really hold on to that. So anorexia nervosa mainly affects girls and mainly affects teenagers. So that's why it's really important to have an open eye on teenagers because eating disorders, specifically anorexia nervosa, starts in teenagers, uh, always starts with a diet. And um, it's a, it's, usually it's a progression. So it's not that from a day to another they are extremely and severely uh, dieting. No, uh, we, we see it in our practice. So I see a lot, a lot of teenagers. Uh, the majority of my patients are actually teenagers suffering from anorexia nervosa. And when I ask them, when did it all start? Uh, all of them answer me that I just wanted to lose a few kilograms because I wasn't happy with my body or I had extra uh, fat on my belly or on my thighs. So I started restricting, for example, only sweets, desserts and fast food. But then I started cutting down on carbs and then I started uh, reducing my meals. So from five meals a day, I... I completely eliminated my snacks and it came even more extreme until it became completely rigid and inflexible. And when they come to me, they reach the point where they barely eat five types of food, literally, and one, two meals. So it depends on each patient, definitely. But yes, they reach a point where it's extreme and inflexible. And uh, we see that they lose a significant, a significant amount of weight. Um, 
and yes, they become underweight. Um, and really, it is dangerous and it impacts their emotional life, their psychological well being, and their medical well being. Now, there is some important notes that I need you to know. Uh, you don't need to look anorexic in order to suffer from anorexia nervosa. You don't need to be the thinnest in the room to have an anorexia nervosa because there is what we call atypical anorexia nervosa, which means you are suffering from an anorexia nervosa and yet your BMI is higher than my team. Uh, I will give you more um, details about that in our next slide. Another important note is that uh, not all sufferers from anorexia nervosa lose their period. So that used to be a criteria in the DSM-4, but in the new DSM-5, the criteria was removed. Because yes, you might have someone coming to you in your practice, uh, they fit all the criteria of anorexia nervosa, but still they still have their period. So they still need to get treated. So what is exactly a typical anorexia nervosa? Like I told you, it is first um, having uh, anorexia nervosa, but yet being of a BMI that is higher than 19. We usually see it in patients who uh, were previously overweight or obese and uh, went, uh, and went on their uh, bariatric surgery, so gastric surgery. And uh, or people who have excessive muscle mass. So this is why their BMI is higher than 19. But although their BMI is higher than 19, they are not underweight. They are actually starved for their body. They are completely uh, showing all signs of starvation. They do have this anorexic mindset. They are completely uh, obsessed with their weight, completely obsessed with thinness. Uh, uh, they have a morbid fear of gaining weight. Uh, they are restrictive, uh, restrictively and severely dieting, and yet their BMI is more than uh, 19. So like also they display all features of starvation. Anorexia nervosa as a chronic illness uh, is treatable and it, uh, someone can fully recover from it, but it is very important for a full recovery to happen uh, to, to be able to treat the sufferer uh, within the first three years of the onset. Uh, the earlier the treatment, the better the outcome, uh, the more chances the person has to get a full recovery. Um, Patients who get their eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, at an early age, so in the adolescence, they, and those who are treated in their adolescence age, they have better prognosis. Uh, about 70% of patients have full and lasting recovery when they are treated when they are still in, uh, as adolescents within the first three years of onset. And the time of recovery takes around three to five years. Uh, but uh, it is done, it is possible, and we've seen so many patients in our practice coming to us, they, they were around 17 years old, although they've been suffering uh, since the age of 12, really now they are in complete remission, fully recovered, living the best life they ever had, um, and however, for adults, so what we say, what we call severely and enduring eating disorders, patients suffering from anorexia, nervosa. Um, it is harder for them because they've been living most of, her, uh, of their life with their eating disorder, but still with a proper treatment and the best evidence-based treatment uh, to treat eating disorder, it is possible to recover from it and even have full recovery, but they are more prone to relapse. So, all eating disorders have common underlying psychopathology. They all share common ground, psychopathology. The first one, which is a very important one, every sufferer from any type of eating disorder over-evaluate their shape and their weight, meaning they entirely base their self-esteem or self-worth based on their body shape, body weight, and their physical aspect. 
which means if they are dissatisfied with their shape and weight, they see themselves as worthless. Their general population, we of course, we all don't love ourselves fully. We all might uh, dislike a specific body part or really have some body dislike, but it doesn't affect our self-esteem entirely because we base our self-worth and self-esteem based on how we are doing well in our professional life, how we are as a mother, as a parent, how we are doing with our relationships, with our hobbies, with our work or uh, studies, academic uh, performance. So our shape just takes a part of our self-esteem. But, but sufferers from an eating disorder, no. They, uh, all these areas of life are just uh, secondary and even left behind. Basically, it's their shape their weight, their body, that really Id uh, identify and determine their self-esteem and self-worth. And as a consequence, they will use multiple different behaviors and these behaviors to, to check their, their weight and shape. And these behaviors actually feed their over-evaluation of shape and weight. It's maintained the over-concern. Um, such behaviors are the weight checking or the weight avoidance. So we see patients completely obsessing with the weight to a point that they check their weight multiple times a day on the scales. Or the contrary, they completely avoid weight checking. Uh, and you can and we see them, for example, for years they've been uh, um, they've been um, completely uh, disregarding their weight. The body checking or the body avoidance is also another expression uh, that maintains this over concern. So very commonly sufferers will constantly check their body, either using mirrors or punching or pinching, sorry, uh, checking their bones, checking uh, uh, their, the, the measurements of their wrist, of their neck, of uh, all body parts, uh, checking uh, using clothes, so to be able to compare or they will avoid, they will avoid seeing their own body and they will avoid letting their loved one, their partner or anyone seeing their body. And that anyway impairs their life. They are unable to go uh, to swimming pools, to the beach, uh, to attend uh, ceremonies or weddings because they don't want to wear clothes that might, uh, might look uh, or might uh, show their body parts. And the feeling of fatness is also one of the expression, very common in all types of eating disorders. So uh, feeling of fatness is very intense in these patients. They feel fat multiple times a day and uh, feeling fat changes. It's not being fat. They might not be fat. Even anorexics feel fat. And as a result, they will restrict even more and they will fall into their loop and an ever ending cycle. Now, in anorexics only, they also evaluate their self-worth and their self-esteem, not only on their weight and shape, but also on how well they are able to control their overeating. If they are able to control their eating, that's a better self-esteem and improvement in their self-esteem. If they feel that they have overeaten and it might be subjective, that crashes their self-esteem. So also it is one of the maintaining mechanism of their eating disorder. All patients suffering from an eating disorder have uh, uh, eating habits that are, that are completely disturbed. Uh, they have dietary restraints, so they control their diet in very strict rigid way to a point that it becomes inflexible they have they have dietary rules when to eat where to eat what to eat i'm not allowed to eat carbs at dinner i'm not allowed to eat after 6 p.m uh, i can't eat from this restaurant but i can eat that dish from that restaurant i can't eat a packaged food but i can eat only if i cook so it's very rigid it's very inflexible so at the end it does impair their social life they can go out and enjoy a meal with friends. They can go out to restaurants. They can go out um, to any places where food is involved. 
So does it mean that everyone who diets will eventually develop an eating disorder? Of course not, of course not. Uh, but some who diet will eventually develop an eating disorder. And what makes the difference is uh, several factors. There's the biological factors, the cultural and social pressures, and the psychological factors. I'll take you through them. So biological factors. So think for uh, for the uh, for this uh, for a moment. If you know that you are wearing a shoe size 37, do you realistically expect to fit in a shoe size 35? Of course not. We know that there's no way your your foot will enter and fit the size 37, 35. Sorry. So why do we expect? Uh, to have a certain body shape or size uh, other than ours or to fit in another body shape and size. We need to know that the genetics do account for 40 to 75 percent of our body type, of our body weight, and it has been proven by so many research. We inherit a certain body type. So if I come from parents who are big, big bones, yeah, it's obvious that I will be a big bone. I will not be a petite person. And as well, we inherit a genetic set point. It's not a point. It's not a specific weight. It is a weight range, plus or minus 5 to 10 kilos. And unfortunately, for those people who inherit a heavy body type, uh, it is seen negatively in our society, and this is why they will develop negative feelings toward their body type, and they will literally do anything to try to fit a smaller body type, and this is when they will start dieting early on, and that's why they are at risk of developing an eating disorder. So our main message here is to say that we cannot change our basic body type. But definitely we can work on being the healthiest uh, within our body type. And uh, this is not feasible if we are using uh, excessive dieting, very severe dieting, if we are severely fasting, using excessive uh, exercise uh, behaviors or using compensatory behaviors. This is not the solution. This will not make us thinner or fit in a smaller body type. On the contrary, it will disturb the body's ability to maintain a healthy weight. There are other biological factors. Uh, these are personality traits that, uh, that we see in some people and that makes them predisposed to develop an eating disorders. Such personality traits are perfectionism, low self-esteem uh, as a core, uh, uh, obsessive compulsive uh, personality disorder, perseverance, determination, and high standards. Uh, really, uh, all patients that I see and who are suffering from anorexia nervosa, I can tell you all of them are A students. All of them are high achievers. They are perfectionists. So they have this personality trait. Another factor that will basically also affect someone from getting an eating disorder is the cultural and social pressures. And honestly, uh, this is a factor, unfortunately, we are all facing and we are all at risk due to that specific factor. Because we are living in a, in a, in a society that is over-evaluating thinness, that is a, a diet mentality, and uh, we are constantly bombarded with images and with messages that thinness is, is what will make you attractive. Thinness is what will make you successful. Thinness is what will uh, make you happy in your life. And uh, these messages and these images are literally overwhelming for all of us. And there's multiple uh, industries that are behind these uh, messages and images. There's the diet industry, there's the supplement industry, there's the fashion industry. And uh, the weight loss and diet market are worth $66 billion every year. So yeah, they, they, they bombard us because this is how they are making even more money. But us, we are at risk and this leads to body dissatisfaction. It makes us want to uh, lose weight, it makes us want to directly diet, it makes us want to directly excessively exercise, 
Plus, now with the new uh, uh, social media platforms, with the fashionistas, with the celebrities, uh, where we see their pictures uh, portraying an ideal world, uh, seeing that although we know that they are edited photos, yet it increased our body dissatisfaction. And uh, basically, we, we, we believe now that we all need to fit the same mold. We all need to fit the same specific body shape and size. And um, that is very uh, risky. And it increased the risk of developing an eating disorder. There's a new study very recently that has been published it was uh, published in May 2020 by the Journal of Eating Disorders, and they found a direct link between posting edited photos and uh, on Instagram and eating disorders. Because people, when they were seeing these edited photos airbrushed or photoshopped or any edited photo, it increased their body dissatisfaction. Oof, wow, like I did just not hello. يا عذرا لك انا شكلي لا 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 انا رح بلش دايت خلص خلص مش معقول مش مقبول يي لك هيدي مقصم معدتها يلا انا رايحه اعمل سبار كل يوم كل يوم بدي اعمل لي شي ساعتين سبار يا اوف كورس بيكوز وي اونلي سي ا فولس رياليتي وي دونت سي ذا اكشوال رياليتي سو Imagine if tomorrow women woke up and decided they really liked their bodies. Just think how many industries would go out of business. So our message here is that thinness is not even a variable that is correlated to happiness. And it should not be linked to self-esteem and self-worth. And actually, if you look at celebrities, uh, uh, I mean, Hollywood celebrities, uh, uh, actors, singers, uh, these people are beautiful. They have everything to be uh, to fit a certain body shape and size. And yet their photos are being edited. And yet they are the ones who are mostly depressed who are dealing with mental health issues and the suicide risk is really prevalent in their society. So yeah, thinness has nothing to do with happiness. The true message is that we are worth much more than a number on a scale. It should not determine who we are, uh, how well we are doing in our academic life, how well we are doing in our personal life, uh, 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 how well we are successful, this should determine us, but not the scale. It should not define our happiness or our uh, self-worth. And again, unfortunately, the media is doing everything uh, to make us see a false reality, thus leading us to diet even more. And diet is the number one risk factor for developing an eating disorder. The last um, the factor to develop an eating disorder is the emotional factors. Not everybody has this, but yes, some people, they lack the ability to self-regulate, to cope with their emotions and feelings. And as I told you previously, their soul and their main coping mechanism for their emotions and feelings is using food uh, because they don't know how to regulate and manage their negative emotions and uh, they need to fill this internal void. So in therapy, we teach them other coping mechanisms other than food to be able uh, to, 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 to have a more balanced way of coping. Uh, it's important for everyone, for you as a parent or as a brother or as a sister, as a teacher, as a, a healthcare professional to be able to identify warning signs of someone who might have been struggling with an eating disorder or who is starting an eating disorder. Because patients suffering are not going to come to your door or to come and see you and tell you, you know what, I'm suffering from an eating disorder, please help me. Uh, why? Because one, they are either ashamed and guilty of their behavior, so they will do everything to hide it, or they do not realize at the beginning they have a problem. And again, part of it is because the society is praising them because there is a lack of awareness. And if they do know they have a problem, uh, they don't want to give up their behaviors. As I said earlier, it's because they, it's 
one of the only means to control the external world. Uh, or uh, it's been so long they are living with their eating disorder that it is very difficult for them to let go of it. So what are the warning signs? There's three types, the physical, the behavioral, and the psychological warning signs. The physical warning signs that you might see is when you see a sudden or a rapid weight loss. So someone who is losing 10 kilograms uh, in a month, that's something that needs to we need to raise a red flag but uh, knowing that there are other reasons that someone might lose so much weight might be a medical reason can be an illness but just for us we need to raise a warning sign without telling them you lost 10 kilos are you dealing with an eating disorder no it should be in a very subtle way uh, we and we need to see multiple signs to really say okay this person might be battling with an eating disorder or there's the frequent changes in weight. So a yo-yo weight change uh, in a very short period of time. So it's not normal to see someone uh, losing 10 kilos and the second month seeing them gaining back their 10 kilos and then losing the five. Levels. There's something fishy that we need to also uh, raise awareness and be basically open to, to see what's the reason. Uh, loss or disturbance of menstrual period, again, uh, it's not anymore a criteria, but yes, if there's a disturbance associated with other factors, that might be a reason why this person is not eating enough, uh, their body is starved, is undernourished. Uh, being cold all the time, this is another sign of starvation um, because their body is shutting down. Uh, being tired all the time. The Russell signs, which is bruised knuckles, this is when someone is constantly uh, self-vomiting, so eventually they will have bruises on their knuckles, or their dental erosion, so their teeth are uh, completely um, uh, affected by the acidity that comes out when they are trying to vomit. So this is a dental erosion picture that you can see, and this is the knuckle sign. The behavioral warning signs, so when we see someone who previously used to eat normally from everything and suddenly they have a, ch a change in their food preferences, so suddenly they start to refuse to eat certain types of food, suddenly they claim that they dislike this food, although previously they used to eat it, uh, someone who claims that they have difficulty digesting food, or uh, they avoid the food groups, for example, out of the sudden they become vegan or vegetarian or gluten intolerant or uh, anything they, they or dairy free this is also something fishy uh, so, uh, when they have a sudden interest in healthy eating but again in a rigid and obsessional way so only i have i can't listen eco gmo free uh, organic bass uh, no 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 i'm a shoe fries or burger this is also something that is into an extreme. Uh, making list of good and bad food, so like literally list, uh, good I can eat, bad, no, forbidden for me. Uh, when there's a repetition and a constant dieting uh, pattern, so skipping meals, uh, fasting, as a mean to lose weight, uh, counting calories, using apps to count their calories, and everything they need to eat, they need to la 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 enter the and calculate, uh, replacing meals by fluids, uh, and seeing them auto suddenly they start to uh, no thank you I can't come tonight uh, or they they have so they they literally have social withdrawal start to be more isolated. Uh, they avoid uh, previously enjoyed activities or social gathering that around that is involving food when uh, they always find an excuse in order not to eat no thank you i already eat and la i have an intolerance for that food i have an allergy for that food uh, or when they change their way they are dressing up so starting to wear baggy clothes to to, to hide their bodies or uh, they are always in denial of hunger. They are always not hungry. La la la, I'm fouled. La la, I can't eat. Always, always. And the body checking behavior. So if you see someone who constantly check their body with the mirrors, with the scales, or with the clothes. 
sufferers from an eating disorder, they have patterns and they have obsessive rituals in terms of their eating and in terms of their food preparation. So these patients are so rigid and inflexible that they follow a rigid schedule. I can eat only at a very specific and certain time of the day. Other than that, I'm not allowed. Uh, I have to prepare, I have to, uh, to do some rituals before, during and after meals. Example, I have to eat in a certain type of plate, small plate, using a small fork and knife, using a specific cup. I have to eat very slowly. I have to separate my food. I have to rearrange them. I have to cut them in very small pieces. I have to take forever when I want to eat a meal. So these are rituals that they fall into, and this is also a sign of starvation. And in the food preparation, they are very rigid. So they need to be always on top of their food and to control how is it being prepared, from what grocery uh, list, what brand. Uh, it's very common. I had patients who come and tell me, uh, I can only eat packaged food, but I can't eat any food that is being cooked. Why? Because packaged food, they have calorie counting, they have the nutritional value. So they know exactly how much to eat and they record. If their mom is cooking the meal, they will never eat it. They prefer to eat pancakes that comes from package because they know the calories. But if mom is doing the pancake, there's no way I can know how much butter or sugar she put. So I can't eat it. I can eat a specific bread, only that brand, because I know they are all cut in the same size. I can't eat a wooden bakery, for example, but sorry, I don't mean to, to name uh, brands. I mean, whatever uh, bakery, because uh, the slices are not even. Um, and they are obsessed with food due to the physiological pressure. So they want to cook, they want to try new recipes, and they will love to feed you, but they will never eat. So you will see them always in the kitchen cooking, looking at recipe books, buying uh, cooking books, and, and reading nutritional guides, but they will never eat them. And they will always look for uh, different types of food and nutritional facts. And all of these are by actually signs of starvation. Their body is asking them to eat. This is a physiological pressure. And eventually, it's completely impairing. This is completely um, distorted. So what can we do to help? First, do no harm. As health professionals, it is our responsibility to really help patients and not uh, aggravate their situation. So if you have someone coming into your clinic whether you're a psychologist or a dietitian, I'm sure you have your own way to assess a patient. But now that you know the different warning signs, you need to be able to have the sense of whether there's something going on with this patient or not. Are they, are they very obsessing on their weight, their shape, and their eating? And if they do, please do not put your patient on a weight loss plan. It will do more harm than good because losing weight is not the solution. They need to treat first their mental disorder, their relationship with the food. They need to treat how they perceive themselves as a whole, uh, how to treat their self-esteem other than basic, basing it with the food. And... Uh, if you're not a, a, a practitioner in eating disorder, and this is not your, your field of expertise, it's okay, but at least you, there's some point that you can do to help them, at least for the beginning. You can educate them on the effect of starvation. You can educate them on the severe dieting, what it does on the body, that actually it leads to more weight gain. Uh, teach them about uh, the severe dieting, the effect that it has on their physical, their mental, their medical and their cognitive, cognitive performance, uh, explain the genetic set point. Yes, it's difficult, it takes a lot of time and it needs therapy to accept that we come from different shape and sizes and that unfortunately we cannot expect to fit a certain uh, um, shape, but at least give them the knowledge about them because not everyone know that we come in different shape and size. Explain that using compensatory behaviors such as purging, uh, laxatives, diuretics, uh, vomiting are inefficient. They will not make them lose weight. On the contrary, it will make the body always to push 
to its predisposed genetic set weight, so it will lead to even more weight gain and guide them towards a healthy lifestyle. Of course, we do help patients lose some weight if they need to do so due to medical or due to psychosocial uh, impairment. Of course, we help them lose weight, but there's a certain way. It needs to be a moderate weight loss. It needs to be balanced without restrictions, just to know how much to eat in moderation of all the food groups. It's okay to introduce sweets and desserts and fast food from time to time. We teach them how to do so. And this is how their body will adjust to it, to being their, the healthiest in, within their body shape and size. And this is how at least it is a maintainable and a sustainable way for them to be the healthiest possible. And it will put them uh, in a safe zone from binge eating. And yes, of course, we do recommend and we do encourage uh, physical activity, but not for the sole purpose of losing weight. It needs to be done for the overall well-being, uh, for fun, for a stress relief, uh, not just to be thin. And as uh, my last uh, note for you, it is that, yes, they do need to be treated. They do need psychotherapy. As dietitians, we are not uh, equipped to deal with such an eating disease, such a deadly uh, mental health disease on our own. Uh, so we need to be able to refer our patients to specialized professionals in the field that are using evidence-based treatment. And uh, for that, you can go and check the uh, website of mida.me where you will find uh, the helpline and you will find the names of uh, the, uh, the special uh, professionals who are dealing with eating disorders. Thank you. I hope I wasn't too long. Yeah, Dina, that was a very, very beautiful uh, talk. And I think it's quite insightful. You need to drink that water. Um, um, we've um, a bit past the, the time, but if our participants, um, no problem. If our participants um, have questions, um, We'd really uh, love to cover them. It was quite interesting. And it also, in a nutshell, when we hear what you were describing in the different types of eating disorders, and while you were talking about things to avoid, it's amazing how many of those things or avoidance relate today to typical diets, to detox diet, to keto diet, to uh, intermittent fasting diet, to all of that. But at the end of the day, the equation is quite simple. Intake and uh, input-output kind of um, approach. Um, yet again, if we are in a way ready to uh, diet, if we can, um, if, if we're not doing it for the wrong reasons, and if we um, need to address the core problem, the internal problem first, um, and maybe deal with self-esteem, with, with body image, and all of that. Um, I don't know if participants, I'm just looking to see if we have any questions. Uh, nothing yet, but I'll take advantage of this and uh, ask one of the questions that we have received online on the um, a reservation or um, uh, our SVP form. And um, one of the questions from Marilyn Rizzi is, how can a health, prof health professionals and dietitians talk to eating disorders patients and how can they counsel them if they refuse seeing a psychologist? Because, you know, there's a certain stigmata when it comes in certain circles about going and seeing a psychologist. I would also add to that point, um, just like maybe um, um, a, a dietitian needs to be certified or needs to have certain training, but also um, not every psychologist is uh, the right person to go to. So if you can answer those two questions yes. in terms of what is the approach and how to choose or select the dietitian or the psychologist. So uh, first, uh, like everything in life, as if we lecture someone, it will never be useful. So 
whether we are a loved one or whether we are a dietitian, if we come and we tell our patient, I think you have an eating disorder, you need to go and get treated and, and you have to, you have to, it's not going to be beneficial. They will never do it. So it should be in a collaborative approach. We need to try to help the patient understand that they have a problem and the patient needs to acknowledge and realize that they have a problem. So it's with the questions, uh, motivation and interviewing that we will be able to show them. We can ask them questions such as, so is it, uh, how do you feel with your weight? So how much does it take of your importance in life? Uh, are you able to properly function? Uh, uh, are you being able to concentrate? Are you being able to do so? Until they acknowledge that they have a level of impairment due to their eating and weight, this is when we captured the patient. And this is when they will realize, oh yeah, I have a problem. It's literally taking all my life. Everything I, I think of from the moment I wake up to the moment I sleep, even in my sleep is about my eating, my weight and my shape. And I'm serious. They do dream about their weight and they do dream about their eating. Because you also need the society. Like if we want to talk only about Lebanon and not everywhere, but I think it's the same even in, in the UAE, specifically in Dubai, uh, body image does matter. You need to fit a certain criteria. And this is why you have the uh, lips and the nose and the cheeks and the back end and all of this. So society is really driving us towards uh, being like that. So um, Part of things is also um, uh, societal awareness about the topic. 100%. And unfortunately, we cannot change the society, although we need to be able to, to say that we all come in different shape and size. We, all, we are all beautiful the way you, we are. Uh, that doesn't define us how we look at. And yes, it's true. And our society, how do you feel about it? How Exactly. Do you so also, um, uh, so this is what we use uh, in the treatment. Basically, the psychology, the psychological part is to help patients uh, know how to respond to such um, comments. It's to help the patient see their self-worth and their self-evaluation more, much more than just their weight and their shape. Uh, to uh, to to uh, rearrange and to um, basically heal the relationship that someone has with their eating. And then once their eating disorder is treated, definitely, if they still wish to lose weight, we can help them. We don't tell them, no, you're not allowed. Anyway, everything is done with collaborative approach. And like I said, as a dietitian who is not in that field, uh, she just need, or we need to use empathy. We need to use a non-judgmental approach, and we need to help the patient, him or herself, uh, uh, see that they have a problem, and they need to take uh, basically uh, their own uh, as a solution to want to go to treatment. So again, mm -hmm. we just show them the level of impairment. Now. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, it can be done. So it is a bit uh, long for me to give it a full uh, thing, but I'm happy to help uh, to give another talk and, and specifically what, how does it happen? And uh, that can be uh, a talk I can give for dietitians. So how, what's the first approach that they can, they can have and a proper assessment to help the patient mm -hmm. acknowledge they have an issue? Then, uh, yes, it's important in our... Uh, part of the world to know who is already dealing uh, and who is specialized in treating eating disorders. Yes, it needs to be done by a psychologist mainly because it is a mental disorder. I cannot, even if I'm a practitioner, I cannot deal on my own with eating disorders. I'm but of course you can refer and this is what we're also uh, asking fellow dietitians. When you're seeing someone who might have those symptoms, if you may say, of eating disorders, please refer to a specialist and um, uh, deal with the situation as well. Like um, maybe it's a joint uh, kind of approach 
like the yeah. one that yeah. you're uh, dealing with. Thank you, Anna. Anna is uh, leaving us, so uh, thank you for being here. To, to say, so psychologists, not any psychologist can do it. The psychologists need to be uh, trained in uh, particular therapies that are designed for eating disorders. For example, the golden standard to treat eating disorders is CBT. E, not CBT, so it's cognitive behavioral therapy enhanced for eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So not a psychologist who knows CBT can deal with it. It should be the enhanced form to treat the mm -hmm. eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So yes, we need to know who are specialized in that. And that's why I gave the MEDA website because on MEDA website, they are putting who are the people that are working in Lebanon or in the UAE or in the MENA region and that are helping. Now, unfortunately, we are lacking uh, uh, healthcare professionals. We unfortunately, this is an opportunity. Yes, we want, we are really dying to have more psychologists and dietitians um, to, to get to the expertise in the eating disorder because like we saw the prevalence is high and the demand is high but and when we do the awareness we ha we are bombarded with patient with people asking for our help but then we find ourselves we are lacking the resource so mm -hmm. for those who want to get uh, proper training and want to be able uh, to to treat uh, there, the the MIDA, uh, since it's the only Middle East association for the eating disorders, they do uh, encourage and they do help for to get the proper trainings. So also that's Perfect. why I check the the website for those who want. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Karina. Really, it was quite uh, insightful. And I, I believe a, a good uh, learning curve. They're saying very interesting. Thank you. Love it. We did love it. And I think this is an important approach where each one of us needs to understand where they stand and uh, support in different ways for healthcare professionals, as you said, maybe to learn a little bit more because there's prevalence and there's a, ba a, a big need. Uh, 40 something percent is not a small uh, number at all. It's a, quite a huge one. And um, on that, I wish everyone a great weekend and uh, stay safe in Lebanon. Stay safe twice uh, with the unrest that probably we're going to have this afternoon and with the Corona uh, virus. And I invite everyone, if you have any question for Karina, do drop us an email at alumni.talks at ndu.edu.lb. The session was recorded and we will uh, post it on uh, NDU YouTube channel. Uh, I invite those who are still with us to attend on Wednesday uh, a beautiful session about uh, customer experience management with alumni uh, Maya Khalife. And on that, I bid you farewell and we'll catch you later. Karina, merci uh, Enjoy Dubai and the hot weather. And, uh, I hope it wasn't too heavy. Sorry for the time. <laughs> I'm not a professional and I enjoyed every single bit of it. So, uh, uh, in a way or another, it's an eye opener uh, for people who've been dieting uh, unsuccessfully or successfully or doing the yo-yo part of things to really understand and you know, uh, you might need to go and see a professional to uh, to deal with the situation. So, merci uh, kitir, Anjad. Until we maybe do another talk or yeah. another uh, or another on-campus presentation for sure. fellow alumni. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Merci, Elik. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Bye bye. bye.